part five chapter three of the life of florence nightingale volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the life of florence nightingale volume two by edward tyus cook setting reformers to work continued parts four and five in india itself advance with sir john lawrence at the helm was rapid the president and the secretary of each sanitary commission were required to devote their whole attention to the work they were charged to consider and afford advice and assistance in all matters relative to the health of the army and to supervise the gradual introduction of sanitary improvements in barracks hospitals and stations as well as in towns in proximity to military stations of every step taken miss nightingale was kept informed sir john wrote to her frequently to report progress he described to her the condition of all the stations he had inspected on his way up to simla he applied to her for information on special points his private secretary dr hathaway who also had seen miss nightingale before he left england wrote yet more fully and frequently the president of the bengal commission was mr strachey he too had made miss nightingale's acquaintance and they corresponded at great length dr j p walker a surgeon in the indian army was in england in december eighteen sixty three he wrote to miss nightingale as a devoted follower of her school he went out to india was appointed secretary of the bengal commission and at every stage consulted her and reported to her mr r j ellis president of the madras commission and dr leith president of the bombay one also corresponded with her to any official in india from the governor-general downwards who was ready to listen miss nightingale had much to say the correspondence with sir john lawrence is the most interesting sir john lawrence to miss nightingale simla june twelfth eighteen sixty four it was truly kind of you to write and give me so nice an account of my children what an exciting time must garibaldi's visit to england have been he is indeed a noble fellow and fully worthy of all our sympathies i only trust that he will be persuaded to keep quiet and bide his time a good day for his country if the people only deserve it must surely come i am doing what i can to put things in order out here but it is a very uphill work and many influences have to be managed and overcome i often think of the last visit i paid you before leaving england and of your conversation on that occasion you will recollect how much i dwelt on the difficulties which meet one on every side these have been exemplified in a way i could scarcely understand or anticipate by the good folks of england really believing that i had sanctioned an attack on the religion of the hindus because i desire to improve the health of the people in calcutta miss nightingale to sir john lawrence thirty two south street september twenty sixth eighteen sixty four my dear sir john lawrence i always feel it a kind of presumption in me to write to you and a kind of wonder at your permitting it i always feel that you are the greatest figure in history and yours the greatest work in history in modern times but that is my very reason we have but one sir john lawrence your bengal sanitary commission is doing its work like men like martyrs in fact and what a work it is all we have in europe is mere child's play to it health is the product of civilization that is of real civilization in europe we have a kind of civilization to proceed upon in india your work represents not only diminished mortality as with us but increase of energy increase of power of the populations i always feel as if god had said mankind is to create mankind in this sense you are the greatest creator of mankind in modern history 
would there be any impropriety in your sanitary commission sending copies of their printed minutes to the barrack and hospital improvement commission here through the india office merely for information as far as your bengal commission goes these men don't want urging they have not now to be taught anything which might even appear to interfere with the responsibilities of your commissions unless at their own request is not only undesirable but as far as the bengal commission is concerned useless but if you saw no objection to sending the minutes for information to the war office commission here i am sure they would very much like it or if that would be too formal and official as regards the india office here if they the minutes might be sent to me with permission to show them to one or two such as lord stanley our late chairman of the royal commission dr sutherland and captain galton of the war office etc it would answer the same purpose the india office here does not show now the least jealousy of the barrack and hospital war office commission on the contrary one can scarcely help smiling at the small things it is glad to throw off its responsibility for upon said commission there are three glaring though lesser evils in calcutta about which i know you have been employed lesser though they are and your attention and dr hathaway's have been aroused by them these are one the police hospitals or state of hospital accommodation for sick poor at calcutta the police establishments seem about as bad as possible indeed the poor wretches are brought in mostly to die the parisian system of relief is very good every police station at paris has means of temporary help in cases of emergency until the sufferers can be removed to hospital some such arrangement with a thorough reform of the hospitals and such additional accommodation as may be wanted might meet calcutta's case two the condition of jails and lunatic asylums in india certainly it is not for me to draw your attention or dr hathaway's to this probably he knows more about them than any man living the reports and recommendations of one or two of the jail inspectors show that they want experience as i am sure dr hathaway will agree with me perhaps we might help you by sending out such reports on the subject as may be useful three the seamen at the great ports you have already done so much but rome can't be built in a day bad water bad food bought in bazaars and bad drinks cause a vast amount of disease and death self-supporting institutions such as our sailors homes of which indeed i believe you have already founded more than one would give the men wholesome food and drink and lodgings and day-rooms at little cost so many men perish for want of this kind of accommodation at calcutta where the evil seems greatest it seems to me so base to be writing while you are doing oh that i could come out to calcutta and organize at least the hospital accommodation for the poor wretches in the streets there is nothing i should like so much but it is nonsense to wish for what is an impossibility i am sure you will be glad to hear that one of my lifelong wishes viz the nursing of workhouse infirmaries by proper nurses is about to be fulfilled by the munificence of a liverpool man who actually gives twelve hundred pounds a year for the object but desires not to be named we undertake next month the liverpool workhouse infirmary of one thousand beds the first workhouse that ever has been nursed with fifteen head nurses trained by ourselves and a lady volunteer matron who underwent a most serious course of training at our nurses school at st thomas hospital fifteen assistants and fifty-two ex-pauper women whom we are to train as nurses i am sure it is not for us to talk of civilization for i have seen in our english workhouse infirmaries neglect cruelty and malversation such as can scarcely be surpassed in semi-barbarous countries and it was then i felt i must found a school for nurses for workhouses etc 
the opportunity has come too late for me to do the workhouse nursing myself but so it is well done we care not how i think with the greatest satisfaction upon your reunion with lady lawrence and some of your children god bless you i am yours devotedly florence nightingale p s the calcutta municipality does not seem yet to have wakened up to a sense of its existence it does not know that it exists much less what it exists for still you are conquering india anew by civilization taking possession of the empire for the first time by knowledge instead of by the sword f n the commander-in-chief in india sir hugh rose lord strathnarn was hardly less helpful in the cause than the governor-general the war office had sent to him through the horse guards a letter inviting his attention to the regimental recommendations in the royal commission's report his reply was most sympathetic and his period of command was marked amongst other things by two reforms specially near to miss nightingale's desires he introduced regimental workshops and soldiers gardens in cantonments the war office forwarded his letter to miss nightingale it is quite worth while she wrote in reply august eleventh eighteen sixty four all that has been suffered to have this letter from sir hugh rose and i forgive everybody everything i sing for joy every day she had written previously june six at sir john lawrence's government she made public thanksgiving to the social science congress at edinburgh in october eighteen sixty three she had contributed a paper entitled how people may live and not die in india in which she gave in concise and popular form a resume of the royal commission's report the reading of her paper had been followed by three cheers for florence nightingale she now august eighteen sixty four republished the paper with a preface in which as it were she gave three cheers for sir john lawrence she described how the commissions of health had been appointed in india and how they had now been put in possession of all the more recent results of sanitary works and measures which had been of use at home then she turned to the military authorities and described how several of the worst personal causes of ill health to which the soldier was in former times exposed have been or are being removed the men she wrote have begun to find out that it is better to work than to sleep and drink even during the heat of the day one regiment marching into a station where cholera had been raging for two years were chaffed by the regiments marching out and told they would never come out of it alive the men of the entering battalion answered they would see we won't have cholera they think and they made gardens with such good effect that they had the pleasure not only of eating their own vegetables but of being paid for them too by the commissariat and this in a soil which no regiment had been able to cultivate before and not a man had cholera these good soldiers fought against disease too by workshops and gymnasia she gave account of trades savings banks games libraries noting what had been done and what yet remained to be done in the meantime the regulation two drams have been reduced to one a legislative act imposes a heavy fine or imprisonment on the illicit sale of spirits near cantonments where there are recreation rooms refreshments prices all marked are spread on a nice clean table all these things which in eighteen sixty four were new or exceptional became in later years well established and the rule the main causes of disease among the army in india were however as miss nightingale went on to say want of drainage want of proper water supply want of proper barracks and hospitals but in these respects she had set the reformers to a work which has continued from that day to this 
there was indeed some criticism at the start but this touched only the past and did not seriously affect the future indian officials felt aggrieved as i have already said at the strictures contained in the report of the royal commission and this movement came to a head in two documents one a counter-report by dr leith the chairman of the bombay sanitary commission october eighteen sixty four the other a dispatch december eight from the government of india sir john lawrence on an important point dissenting lord stanley thought that dr leith ought to be answered at once and wrote to miss nightingale october twenty five for her advice on the subject she suggested that the answer should be sent in the form of a report on dr leith's letter by the barrack and hospital improvement commission an ingenious plan as it gave opportunity to that expert body for giving further advice to one of the presidency commissions miss nightingale and dr sutherland drafted the report which was adopted by the commission on january sixth eighteen sixty five i have pleasure wrote lord stanley to her december twenty sixth in sending back the draft reply to dr leith with only one or two verbal amendments suggested it seems to me well done moderate in tone and conclusive in argument a reply to the indian government's dispatch signed by lord stanley dr farr and dr sutherland was sent on may twenty miss nightingale in her eagerness was much annoyed by these criticisms and lord stanley often told her that she made too much of what were only temporary ebullitions don't be discouraged dear miss nightingale he wrote january twenty two when the government of india's dispatch arrived the practical work may go on while the controversy is proceeding my idea of the matter is that the indian authorities only want time to set things a little in order that they are willing to mend but not inclined to give us the credit of having first put them in the right way that is human nature lord stanley was a true prophet the indian authorities did mend and so successfully has the work been carried out by a long line of commanders administrators and engineers that the death rate from preventable disease among the british army in india has fallen far below the figure which the royal commission named as a council of perfection five in this work of salvation miss nightingale was for many years to play a part as consultant and sometimes as inspirer in november eighteen sixty four the governor-general in council intimated his readiness to consider a scheme for the employment of nurses in military hospitals and thereupon the bengal sanitary commission requested miss nightingale to aid them by her advice she wrote in collaboration with sir john mcneill a comprehensive series of suggestions in the following february throughout the year eighteen sixty five miss nightingale was engaged from time to time in indian sanitary business and her house served as headquarters for the sanitary reformers mr ellis the president of the madras commission came home in the middle of the year in order to study sanitary reforms in this country miss nightingale invited him to use her rooms sent dr sutherland to accompany him on visits of inspection to hospitals and barracks arranged meetings between him and lord stanley conferred with him on changes which sir john lawrence was proposing to make in the constitution of the presidency commissions the governor-general himself communicated with her freely on the same subject the secretary of the bengal commission applied to her for information on trustworthy tests for the discovery of organic matter in water being unable to obtain what was wanted from dr parks she applied to dr angus smith inventor of an air test also who wrote a pamphlet for her on the subject it was printed at her expense she had it approved by the war office sanitary committee and a large number of copies was distributed throughout india she had impressed upon the governor-general the importance of stirring up the indian municipalities the indian towns municipal improvement bill eighteen sixty five was submitted for her criticism and she wrote a note on the relations 
which should exist between the powers of raising and spending taxes proposed to be granted to local authorities and the proper execution of sanitary works and measures in india her friend sir charles trevelyan retired from the post of financial minister in india in eighteen sixty five and she made the acquaintance of his successor mr w n massey she was very jubilant when she got a vote of seven millions for my indian barracks she was depressed when the governor-general wrote to her from time to time saying that the great obstacle in the way of speedier reform was want of money but she made excuses for her hero sir john lawrence she wrote to madame mohl march twenty eighteen sixty five is just as much hampered with the horse guards out there as i am here he is always writing to me to apologize for the little progress he makes by the very last mail he says i shall think him timid and perhaps even time-serving i could not help laughing certainly sir j lawrence is the only man who ever called sir j lawrence a time-server except in the highest possible sense of serving his country at her greatest time of need in the highest possible way she was constantly corresponding with lord stanley urging him to win points for her from the indian secretary i have just seen sir charles wood wrote lord stanley february ten he agrees as to the expediency of sending home a yearly report of the sanitary stations in each presidency pray never speak of being troublesome he wrote again may fifteen it is a real pleasure to me to help you a little in the great work i know no other way in which my time can be made equally useful he frequently saw sir charles wood on matters which she urged and he won what was almost her highest praise lord stanley she said is a splendid worker his cool common sense was perhaps a wholesome antidote sometimes to her almost feverish eagerness publicity he said august seventeen will in the long run do what we want people won't stand being poisoned when they know it the annual reports from the presidencies obtained by miss nightingale some years later were submitted for her observations and in many other ways as we shall hear it was remarkable how close a touch upon the course of sanitary reform in india was maintained by this lady from a bedroom in mayfair but essentially miss nightingale's work was that of inspirer and pioneer these chapters will have shown i think that a compliment paid to her by the chairman of the indian sanitary commission was no less true than graceful lord stanley to miss nightingale st james's square july twenty five eighteen sixty four i don't wonder that the delays of the savage tribe should try your patience and i admire the more the care and success with which you keep outward show of annoyance to yourself i had rather be criticised by any one rather than you i am only passing through town to-day there being nothing left to do but shall be again in this place on thursday and ready to wait upon you if any matters want settling if not i can only wish you health success is sure to come and beg that you will remember the value of your own public service and not by overwork endanger its continuance pray excuse a caution which i am sure i am not the first to give every day convinces me more of two things first the vast influence on the public mind of the sanitary commissions of the last few years i mean in the way of speeding ideas which otherwise would have been confined to a few persons and next that all this has been due to you and to you almost alone in one of many moments of vexation at the delays of the savages in their red tape miss nightingale wrote thus to captain galton june twenty three eighteen sixty four the horse guards say that they were quite aware of sir john lawrence's application and of the delay but that it is sir j lawrence's one and only object of interest while it is one out of a thousand of the war offices they ought to have the v c for their cool intrepidity in the face of truth i have told sir j lawrence of the opinion of these 
dining out fray lequays as to his hard work and i think i shall publish it after my death but unlicked cubs as she said at scutari grow up into good old bears and it is not in order to pay off a score against the puppies that i quote this letter behind the remark which excited miss nightingale's righteous anger there was an element of unconscious truth and it is one which sums up this and the preceding chapter it was indeed an ignorant untruth to say that sir john lawrence had no other work or interest than the promotion of sanitary improvements for the army in india and it would be untrue also as later chapters will show to say the same thing of miss nightingale yet it made all the difference for the promotion of that work in india that there was at the head of affairs a man whose heart and soul were in it and at home it made all the difference that there was one resolute will combined with a clear head determined to give impetus and direction to the work it was probably quite true to say that to many perhaps to most of the men at the war office and the horse guards this question of army sanitation in india appeared as only one out of a thousand questions to miss nightingale it was in a very literal and instant sense a matter of life and death and it was her passionate conviction that supplied the initiating and driving force which compelled reform if the governor-general of the time had been hostile or apathetic even her persistence might yet have been foiled but as things were the co-operation between sir john lawrence and florence nightingale was as beneficent in its results upon the welfare of the british army in india as the co-operation between her and sidney herbert had been in the case of the army at home End of Setting Reformers to Work Continued 4 and 5part five chapter four of the life of florence nightingale volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana the life of florence nightingale volume two by edward tyus cook part five chapter four advisory council to the war office parts one through four we begin with a letter from florence nightingale to julius mole january first eighteen sixty four quote we are trying to reduce chaos into shape it is three years to-day since i first felt what an awful wreck i had got myself into i interfering with government affairs and the captain of my ship without whom i should never have done it dying and leaving me a woman in charge what nonsense people do talk to be sure about people finding themselves in suitable positions and looking out for congenial work i am sure if anybody in all the world is most unsuited for writing and official work it is i and yet i have done nothing else for seven years but write regulations though miss nightingale's main work during these years was connected with the army in india she was also continuously engaged in work for the war office in relation to the army at home indeed in some respects the work was as constant and it was quite as varied if not as far-reaching in range as in the days when sidney herbert was secretary of state she was a kind of advisory council to the war office on all subjects within her sphere and on some outside it but the references to her were far more frequent than is commonly the case with those somewhat shadowy bodies and besides she was a privileged person with the right of initiating suggestions the picture of her relations to the war office as it is disclosed in her papers is remarkable there are scores of letters from the ministers there are hundreds from one of the non-political undersecretaries her own letters in reply are equally numerous there is a large collection of drafts minutes warrants regulations her private letters tell of frequent interviews with one of the ministers 
was there ever another case in which nearly every vexed question in war office administration other than of a purely military kind was referred almost as a matter of course to a private lady and that lady an invalid in her bed it is not likely that the situation will ever exist again and it becomes of interest to trace the nightingale power in this matter to its sources one the primary explanation is simple in a large class of questions which were occupying the attention of the war office at this time miss nightingale was regarded as the first expert of the day one sees this in the fact that she was consulted in connection with work within her sphere for other departments than the war office thus in eighteen sixty five mr r s wright afterwards the judge was appointed by the colonial office to prepare a report on the condition of colonial prisons he went to miss nightingale asking on april twenty seventh quote, to be allowed to submit to you for your criticism the conclusions at which i may arrive supposing them to be approved by you it will be a great advantage if i may state that you approve them then in the second place to repeat a phrase which i have already applied to her she was the official legatee of sidney herbert every one who was behind the scenes knew that his work had also been her work and sidney herbert's repute as a reformer stood very high the official army world at this time was divided into two camps those who desired to complete herbert's work and those who tried to undo it miss nightingale as the repository of the herbert tradition was the indispensable ally of the former party against the latter her friend lady herbert put the case from her point of view when she wrote on march seventh eighteen sixty two in reply to a letter telling of much weakness and weariness Quote, if you never wish to live for your own sake yet bear to live dearest for a time to carry out his work and to keep his memory fresh in the hearts of men End quote. some questions of reform arose to which sir benjamin hawes had raised copious objections quote, would miss nightingale oblige the political under-secretary by suggesting an answer to hawes's points End quote sometimes she was the only person who possessed the necessary documents quote, have you got a copy of the report of the committee on the organization of a medical school the war office actually have no copy and the army medical department only a proof not signed and supposed to have been altered End quote. but besides all this there were personal factors in the case miss nightingale had no longer it is true an intimate friend at the head of the war office and with lord herbert's successor sir george lewis she was not otherwise than by correspondence acquainted early in eighteen sixty two he had made overtures through sir harry verney desiring to be given the honour of making miss nightingale's personal acquaintance she was however too ill to receive him and knowing perhaps her proficiency in the classics he sent her some of his jeu d'esprit the offering had anything but a propitiatory effect many of her letters express indignation that the secretary for war should be writing trifles in latin instead of reforming the war office she was equally indignant when he presently published learned works on ancient astronomy and egyptology mr jowett was somewhat of the same mind Quote, i agree with you about sir g lewis and his book i felt the same disgust at gladstone for writing nonsense about homer while the east india bill was passing through the house End quote. it does not seem to follow however that mr gladstone would have been the more interested in the east india bill if he had not been engaged in finding the trinity on mount olympus or that sir george lewis would have been any more in the mood to reorganize the war office if he had not been applying the egyptological method to modern history or turning hey diddle diddle into latin verse there is a keener point in another of miss nightingale's reflections on the minister in february nineteenth eighteen sixty three she wrote quote, if sir george lewis instead of writing a dialogue on the best forms of government would write or rather silently act a monologue on the dual form being the worst form of government the war office would be much the gainer 
but during his term of office the under-secretary was lord de grey and with him she was on very friendly terms and he as is obvious from the correspondence had the highest opinion of her knowledge her ability and her influence the part she played in lord de grey's appointment as secretary of state after the death of sir g lewis has already been described then in captain galton she had throughout these years a standing ally within the war office and her daily attendant dr sutherland was a member of the army sanitary committee and in the last resort if a difficulty worthy of such adjustment arose she had the ear of the prime minister two such occasion did arise when on may fifteenth eighteen sixty two death removed from the war office miss nightingale's old opponent sir benjamin hawes the permanent under secretary she had tried to reorganize him into insignificance in eighteen sixty one but ben had beaten sidney herbert now was a chance of carrying out the plan which mr herbert and she had often discussed of breaking the bureaucracy and of dividing up the office hitherto the departments had reported through the permanent under secretary the reform scheme was that they should report directly to the secretary of state sir e lugard military under secretary was already in part possession let captain galton resign his commission and take the other half as a civilian and what was equally in her mind a convinced and professional sanitarian she carried the case to the prime minister and convinced him lord palmerston told her afterwards that when the appointment was first mentioned to the horse guards they said it was simply impossible but the prime minister advised sir george lewis to make the appointment nevertheless miss nightingale wrote to her father nine chesterfield street poor queen's birthday eighteen sixty two i must tell you the first joy i've had since poor sidney herbert's death lord palmerston has forced sir g lewis to carry out mr herbert's and my plan for the reorganization of the war office in some measure hawes's place is not to be filled up galton is to do his work as assistant under secretary this brings with it some other reforms lord de grey says that he can reorganize the war office with captain dalton because sir g lewis will know nothing about it and never inquires sir g lewis wrote it innocently to the queen yesterday and captain galton was appointed to-day resigning the army of course no sir charles trevelyan would not have done it all in hawes place it would have been perpetuating the principle which i have been fighting against in all my official life i e for eight years of having a dictator an autocrat irresponsible to parliament quite unassailable from any quarter immovable in the middle of a so-called constitutional government and under a secretary of state who is responsible to parliament and inasmuch as trevelyan is a better and abler man than hawes it would have been worse for any reform of principle i don't mean to say that i am the first person who has laid down this but i do believe i am the first person who has felt it so bitterly keenly constantly as to give up life health joy congenial occupation for a thankless work like this it has come too late to give happiness to galton it has come too late for me he seems more depressed than pleased and i do believe if he feels any pleasure it is that now he can carry out sidney herbert's plans in some measure and it may seem to you some compensation for the enormous expense i cause you that if i had not been here it would not have been done would that sidney herbert could have lived to do it himself would that poor clo could have lived to see it he wished for it so much for my sake End quote the high hopes which miss nightingale entertained from this slight reorganization were doomed to disappointment neither as under secretary nor after april eighteen sixty three when he became secretary of state did lord de grey manage and i do not know that he seriously attempted to reform the war office root and branch he and captain galton had according to miss nightingale miscalculated their power she preached the necessity of reform to them unceasingly in season and as they may sometimes have thought out of season too for she was a very persistent person and with dr sutherland's assistance she provided them with detailed schemes 
her principles were as admirable as was her criticism scathing when any breach of them came under her notice there must in all things she said be a clear definition of responsibility with a logical differentiation of functions and the business of the war office was to prepare for war not to jog along with an organization which might hold together in peace but would break down in the field some papers were submitted to her criticism june eighteen sixty two what strikes me in them she wrote is the black ignorance the total want of imagination as to a state of war in which the war office seems to be really if it was a joint stock company for the manufacture of skins it could not as far as appears be less accustomed to contemplate or to imagine or to remember a state of war End quote. i am afraid that most of us have lived through times when the same criticism could have been made let us hope that it is all a matter of ancient history now papers were sent to her dealing with the questions of purveying and commissariat the commissariat had hitherto been the bankers of the army and some of the permanent officials saw no reason for a change from her experience in the crimea she gave them the reason the confusion of functions worked badly in the field as it was bound to do for it was absurd Quote, is a man who buys bullocks the best man to be a banker would it not be better to have a separate treasurer for the army to receive all monies and issue them to all departments in private life nobody makes his steward or butler his banker it would not be economical finance is as much a specialty as marketing and as much so to say the least of it in the army as in private life End quote. three complete reform of the war office was then to remain a task for the future but miss nightingale thought that lord de grey and captain galton did the administrative work well much of it was done with her assistance from miss nightingale's point of view the most common thing done under the lewis de grey regime was the placing on a permanent footing of the barrack and hospital improvement commission it was important first as keeping sound sanitary principles to the forefront in the execution of new works at home it also as already explained provided machinery for promoting sanitary improvements in india the point next to its permanence on which she most insisted was that the commission should not be under the army medical department but should be directly responsible to the secretary of state lord de grey said wrote captain galton on june twenty fifth eighteen sixty two that he had adopted exactly your minute about the instructions to the commission End quote. with its secretary mr j j frederick miss nightingale was on very friendly terms and dr sutherland was its most active member most of the plans for new barracks or hospitals were submitted to her and her inspection and criticism of them were searching then in eighteen sixty two the government was about to build a new military general hospital at malta with dr sutherland's aid she went into every detail and her report on the plans occupies twenty-four pages of manuscript in eighteen sixty five sir hope grant succeeded sir richard airy as quartermaster-general and in that capacity as chairman of the barrack commission the name of which was now changed to the army sanitary committee he went to see miss nightingale proud to think that she remembered him and the conversation must have been satisfactory for our new president is a trump reported dr sutherland to her in examining plans she always had a thought for the horses when the plans for some cavalry barracks were sent for her criticism she put in a plea june fourth eighteen sixty three for windows in the loose boxes out of which the horses could see i do not speak from hearsay she wrote to captain galton but from actual personal acquaintance with horses of an intimate kind and i assure you they tell me it is of the utmost importance to their health and spirits when in the loose box to have a window to look out at a small bull's-eye will do i have told dr sutherland but he has no feeling End quote to which dr sutherland added quote, we have provided such a window and every horse can see out if he chooses to stand on his hind legs with his fore feet against the wall it is the least exertion he can put himself to and if your doctrine is right he will no doubt do it End quote. 
miss nightingale had learned to love the army horse in the crimea many years later some very bad barracks were closed in ireland and men and horses were moved to the curragh it was the horses she wrote who had done it Quote, if we are not moved they said we shall mutiny military horses are quite capable of organizing movements did you ever hear of jack jack was a riderless horse his master having been killed at the charge of balaklava and he was seen collecting about thirty riderless horses and at the head of his troop leading them back to i suppose cavalry headquarters i have failed to discover whether jack allowed horseless men to mount some of his horses these men certainly returned on horseback but when they found that a comrade or an officer was missing they rode back one and another mounted the wounded man and fought their way out of the russian melee but many died in an attempt a glorious death and when i see in the handsome cabs horses who by their beautiful legs must have been hunters or even racers galloping up park lane as long as they can stand i say too a glorious death and horses should teach us not we them duty do you think all regulations for military hospitals and for their nursing staff were similarly submitted to miss nightingale she had a poor opinion of the capacity of the male mind to frame rules for female nurses by the united skill she wrote on february sixteenth eighteen sixty three of misters blank and blank the following regulations for female hospitals were put together one kennel your nurses and chain them up till wanted two when the number of patients does not exceed blank chain up the nurses without food three let the number of nurses vary every day as the number of patients varies i send you an amended copy which if you approve might be put into type end quote she was constantly appealed to in connection with disputes caused at netley by the difficult temper of mrs shaw stewart the superintendent of the female nursing staff she and miss nightingale were no longer close friends but miss nightingale's sense of justice was strong and she continuously supported mrs stewart's authority four another large batch of the semi-official correspondence is concerned with miss nightingale's favorite child the army medical school and with the position of the army doctors generally the troubles of the professors were still many the relation of the school to the secretary of state on the one hand and to the army medical department on the other was much vexed and when the school was moved to netley in eighteen sixty three a fresh set of difficulties cropped up miss nightingale was constantly appealed to sometimes by the staff sometimes by the war office to smooth over difficulties to suggest ways out to settle disputed questions she was recognized by the war office as a kind of super professor one of the staff sought official sanction for a book on the work of the school Quote, lord de grey wants to know whether he is capable also whether his proposed syllabus is good also to have any critical suggestions upon it which miss nightingale could kindly communicate her verdict was favorable i have been told that some army doctors of to-day knowing little about miss nightingale except that she found fault with the medical arrangements in the crimea suppose her not to have been their friend nothing could be further from the truth what she blamed was not the doctors for most of whom she had the greatest admiration but the system from first to last she was the most efficient friend that the army medical service ever had in eighteen sixty two through sixty three there is a long series of letters from her to the war office in which she persistently pleaded for improvement in their status and emoluments it was in connection with this matter that she wrote to captain galton december twenty fourth eighteen sixty three quote, in re medical warrant i am meek and humble but i cut up rough i am the animal of whom buffoon spoke cet animal féroce mort tous ce que verlaine l'a tué you must do something for these doctors or they will do for you simply by not coming to you End quote. a series of letters to sir james clark in the following year shows with what pertinacity she fought the battle of the army doctors and how indignant she was at any slights cast upon them april sixth eighteen sixty four 
i have written threatening letters both to lord de grey and to captain galton about the medical officer's warrant and after pointing out that both restoration of warrant and increase of pay are now necessary i have shown how when we are exacting duties from the medical officer such as sanitary recommendations to his commanding officer which essentially require him to have the standing of a gentleman with his commanding officer we are doing things such as dismounting him at parade depriving him of presidency at boards etc which in military life to a degree we have no idea of in civil life deprive him of the weight of a gentleman among gentlemen april seventh the w o seems now willing to listen to some kind of terms they are frightened they sent me your letter it was very good very firm don't be conciliatory april ninth i wrote for the tenth time a statement of eight pages with permission to make any use of it they pleased with my signature as to lord herbert's intentions but i positively refused to write mr gladstone who certainly ought not to grant me what the secretary of state of war does not urge april eleventh what is wanted is to put a muzzle on the duke of cambridge and to tell him that he must not alter the royal warrant april fifteenth you may think i am not wise in being so angry but i assure you when i write civilly i have a civil answer and nothing is done when i write furiously i have a rude letter and something is done not even then always but only then in the following year there was a debate in the house of lords upon the military hospitals which greatly interested and personally affected miss nightingale early in march lord dalhousie the lord panmure of earlier days gave notice of a motion to call attention to the expenditure on the netley hospital and the herbert hospital respectively and it was rumoured that the ex-minister intended to deliver a set attack upon two of his successors the late lord herbert and lord de grey the war office in order to be fully prepared sent to miss nightingale for a brief she gladly supplied it and she entered into the fray with great spirit she was very angry that the memory of her dear master should be assailed but i think that she enjoyed not a little the prospect of yet another encounter with quote, the bison she had beaten him before and was determined that he should be beaten now she advised lord de grey to avoid giving any advantage to the enemy by withholding any credit to which he was justly entitled she recalled that at the last time they met lord panmure had complained to her that she ascribed every sanitary reform in the army to sidney herbert though some of the reforms had been started by himself she admitted and advised lord de grey to admit that lord panmure had deserved well of the army by the measures which he took in the crimea and by initiating some steps for reducing the mortality at home these things being admitted the defence of lord herbert would carry the more weight having armed the secretary of state with materials to meet any attacks that might be made miss nightingale turned to organize a second line of defence sir harry verney was dispatched to ask mr gladstone's advice mr gladstone thought that lord harrowby should be retained for the defence and he was approached miss nightingale sent watching briefs also to her friends lord shaftesbury and lord houghton when lord dalhousie's motion was taken the rumours turned out to be well founded he extolled his netley the non-pavilion hospital as perfect and criticised the herbert hospital pavilion as a costly toy in the glass and glare style and in a long speech attacked the wasteful system which lord herbert had introduced by paying attention to quote, hygienists who carried their opinions too far end quote he had i suppose that turbulent fellow miss nightingale in his mind when quote, he could not help thinking that all these unnecessary knick-knacks in hospitals were introduced partly from the habit which prevailed at the war office of consulting hygienists not connected with the army end quote. the personal animus in the attack was thought so obvious that the speech fell very flat and lord de grey's reply quite admirable according to miss nightingale was so courteous yet so conclusive that her counsel was unanimously of opinion that not another word was necessary apart from any personal question dr dalhousie's speech has a certain historical interest as embodying some of the prejudices against which miss nightingale as a hospital reformer had to contend 
a little later in the year a military attack on the sanitariums was threatened in the house of commons but this only took the form of questions about the vote under which payment by the war office to dr sutherland appeared miss nightingale sent a note to the war office setting forth the facts and emphasizing the value of his services in the cause of sanitary improvement this ends part five chapter four advisory council to the war office parts one through four of eight part five chapter four of the life of florence nightingale volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. The Life of Florence Nightingale, Volume 2, by Edward Tyus Cook. Part 5, Chapter 4, Advisory Council to the War Office, Continued. 5. These were subjects in which Miss Nightingale was directly concerned, but questions of many other kinds were referred to her i find in the correspondence with the war office during these years that in addition to matters otherwise mentioned in this chapter her advice was asked upon such subjects as an apothecary's warrant barracks for salon fever tinctures instructions for cholera fittings for military hospitals the proposed amalgamation of the home and indian medical services the organization of hospitals for soldiers wives sanitary instructions for new zealand revision of soldiers rations staff appointments at netley appointment of west indian staff surgeons an outbreak of yellow fever in bermuda the relation of commissariat barracks and purveying at foreign stations victualizing on transports and the mo court-martial on one occasion she was asked to send hints for a speech in the house of commons lord hartington the under secretary for war would have to defend a large increase in the votes for hospital and medical service the crimean war and miss nightingale's crusade had raised the expenditure from ninety seven thousand pounds in eighteen fifty three fifty four to two hundred and ninety five thousand pounds in eighteen sixty four sixty five could you send me a paragraph for lord harrington's speech she was asked to show the salient points of what the nation gets for its money something pithy put in your best manner there is nothing in the world i should like so much she replied february twenty ninth eighteen sixty four as to have to do lord harrington's speech and stand in his shoes on such an occasion she sent some pithy comparisons and in case the minister wanted something heavier a detailed memorandum i suppose lord hartington chose the heaviness and rejected the pith for when miss nightingale read the parliamentary report she thought the speech a poor performance the same kind of references to miss nightingale went on when in eighteen sixty six on lord de grey's transference to the india office lord hartington became secretary of state for war can you throw light she was asked june twenty first eighteen sixty six on the position of the medical officers of the guards this is very pressing the whole matter is an awful mess and lord hartington is anxious to leave it in some way of settlement on the following day a lucid and exhaustive memorandum on the subject went in from her in july eighteen sixty four miss nightingale was engaged on a piece of work for the war office which was closely associated with her crimean experiences and with her european repute it was in august of that year that the international congress was held which framed the famous geneva convention the british delegates were miss nightingale's friend dr longmore and dr rutherford and she drafted their instructions the principle of the convention was the neutralization of the wounded under the red cross societies formed under the red cross were soon organized throughout europe and the movement led to a great development of volunteer nursing in wartime sometimes miss nightingale sent in suggestions on her own account she was in close touch with soldiers and sailors and a woman's sympathetic insight appears in this letter miss nightingale to captain galton september first eighteen sixty three 
people are complaining that when a regiment sails many of their wives and children are left behind and the soldiers are unable to make any provision for their support until they have reached their destination say china or calcutta after a four months voyage round the cape and have been able to send money through their captains to their families at home meanwhile the families have gone through five or six months of distress for sailors leaving a port in england or ireland the admiralty provides power to leave a standing order that a certain amount of pay is to be sent regularly to their families the w o objects that a similar arrangement would quote, involve a change in their bookkeeping end quote. it would involve no change it would involve a small addition i am willing to go the length of a sixpence to furnish an account book to the w o which would enable them to keep these additional accounts the w o also objects that it would deprive the captain of the chance of fining the soldiers for any military offence but they can learn the admiralty system and whilst there are other ways of doing the soldiers their pay is the only means of providing bread for their families starving or doing worse at home surely the soldiers might be allowed to leave for the probable duration of their voyage and for a month or two beyond it a sum to be paid weekly to their representatives at home sir e lugard has been tried and failed pray set this right but the w o would not be the w o if such things as these were not and when they have ceased to be the war office will have ceased to be End quote. satire was not the only weapon which miss nightingale employed in order to get things done sometimes she appealed to the motive of rivalry was the minister hanging back well all she could say was that sidney herbert would have done the thing in a moment there were difficulties in the way were there the subordinate officials were piling up what they were pleased to call reasons to the contrary were they well on this day many years ago she wrote june eighteenth eighteen sixty two the french guns kept coming up again and again to get us out of the yard at hougamont and we answered in strong language often repeated till we kept the ground that we had won i never heard the french guns called reasons and i advise you to answer in the same way because there is no other way of answering lord de grey's minute is the gun which just has to be fired over again End quote. and sometimes she resorted as of old to a little bullying i send you she wrote march twenty sixth eighteen sixty three my protest about the medical school make what use of it you like but if we fail i shall refer it to lord palmerston who as you know befriended us on a former occasion after hawes's death a home thrust this as it was by personal preference to lord palmerston that she had secured captain galton's appointment there was one occasion when for a wonder the pressure to be prompt and decided came not from her but from the war office the governorship of the woolwich hospital fell vacant she had been sent a list of names with a request to advise upon them and she had not immediately replied i wrote she explained february eleventh eighteen sixty three to various authorities the very moment your and lord de grey's letters were put into my hands the answers cannot be long delayed but what would you think of my opinion if i volunteered it about men whom i know only by name had you asked me about lord william paulette or colonel storks or sir richard airy i could have given you an opinion off-hand with the utmost want of modesty the very moment i have any reliable information you shall have it but it takes some time to make such an inquiry or what would it be worth and woolwich i suppose is not on fire or with the enemy at the gates end quote but for some reason or other the war office was in a hurry and the appointment was made before her inquiries were completed her conscientiousness thus lost her the chance of deciding a piece of patronage not indeed that she felt any loss in such a case she was nothing of a jobber she pulled wires as i have told in some special appointments where she believed that a high public cause was at stake but she was never actuated by personal favoritism or by the love of personal influence on behalf of individuals for this very post she had received fifty letters of application she said but she had taken no action upon them only once she said on another occasion had she solicited anything as a personal favor from the war office 
it was an appointment for a presbyterian chaplain who was not personally known to her but whose hard and deserving case as she thought it had been brought to her notice she was once sent a list of the army medical service and asked by a minister to mark the names for his private and confidential use with her approbation or otherwise this she respectfully declined to do when she was asked a specific question about an officer whom she had known in the crimea or elsewhere she gave an opinion freely and generally managed to put it pointedly as of a certain commandant Quote, as you often see in those round-headed red-faced men he has a great deal of conscience and very little judgment End quote. six a subject in which miss nightingale took great and painful interest during these years was the state regulation of vice the legislation of eighteen sixty four eighteen sixty six and eighteen sixty nine was already being promoted and considered in eighteen sixty two the subject was odious to miss nightingale but her experiences in foreign hospitals and at scutari had made her peculiarly familiar with it her private correspondence with doctors and military office shows that for some years before eighteen sixty two she had given much thought and study to the question and had carefully tested conclusions drawn from her personal observations by statistics and by the opinions of other persons she hated the system of regulation on moral grounds but she was equally convinced that the case for it had not been satisfactorily established by statistical evidence on hygienic grounds on this point two of the medical men upon whose judgment she placed most reliance dr sutherland and dr graham balfour the head of the army statistical department agreed with her with their assistance she worked up the case against the continental system and at the request of sir george lewis who was considering the matter in eighteen sixty two she wrote a private paper which was circulated among some members of the government and others your facts wrote captain galton to her april twenty ninth eighteen sixty two have shaken lord de grey's views on the subject of police inspection with mr gladstone she was less successful he found her paper of deep interest and full of important fact and argument and said that as a result of reading it and her letters he should approach the subject with much of circumspection as well as of anxiety but he doubted the possibility of making a standing army a moral institution therein she profoundly differed and she urged in rejoinder that nothing should be done on his assumption at least until the other had been given a fair trial by increasing the soldiers facilities for marriage by giving them better opportunities for instruction and recreation by encouraging physical exercise and manual handicrafts official opinion steadily hardened however in the direction of regulation and presently public opinion was tested by a series of articles in the times in favor of the continental system miss nightingale thereupon supplied harriet martineau with facts and figures and the times was answered by the daily news miss nightingale also printed her own paper for a more extended though still private and confidential circulation dr sutherland chivalrously assumed the sole authorship and was acrimoniously attacked by some of his professional brethren the army medical department was working hard for regulation and some person therein suspecting miss nightingale as the real leader of the opposition disgraced himself by sending her an anonymous letter of vulgar abuse this of course did not deter her and when legislation was proposed she lobbied indefatigably through correspondence against it the opinion of the house of commons was however overwhelmingly in its favor when the legislation was passed the war office invited her assistance in the selection of medical officers under the act but she refused to touch what she regarded as an accursed thing it was left to another of the remarkable women of the nineteenth century to secure after a struggle of sixteen years the repeal of the acts but though miss nightingale shrank from taking a public part in that crusade she gave support privately to mrs josephine butler at a later time however miss nightingale somewhat modified her views 
miss nightingale's failure during the years eighteen sixty two through sixty four to arrest the movement of public opinion in the direction which she detested increased her eagerness to promote what she considered the more excellent way she was the life and soul at headquarters of the movement for increasing the supply of reading rooms soldiers clubs recreation rooms and facilities for useful employment i will tell you she wrote to the reverend mother of the bermondsey convent january third eighteen sixty four how i spent my christmas day and the sunday after those being two holidays in preparing a scheme by desire of lord de grey for employing soldiers in trades she wrote a memorandum on methods of starting an exhibition soldiers trades and such an exhibition was held at aldershot in the summer of eighteen sixty four whenever there was a difficulty to be overcome or an opportunity to be seized miss nightingale was appealed to for instance there was a fight for a certain disused iron house at aldershot miss nightingale's party supposed that the war office wanted it for a men's recreation room the horse guards wanted it for an officers club a promise had already been given in favour of the former but sir george lewis was wavering lord de grey thinks wrote captain galton april twenty ninth eighteen sixty two that the best course for the iron house is for sir henry verney to ask sir g l in the house about it alluding to his former promise and if it could be arranged that monckton milnes general lindsay or any other persons could cheer or support the proposals it would pledge sir g l to act at once miss nightingale set her parliamentary friends to work and the fight for the iron house was won lord de grey succeeding in getting a vote on the estimates for the encouragement of such places miss nightingale revised for him a set of regulations for reading rooms she also at his request drew up in concert with captain pilkington jackson an inventory of the appropriate furniture and other fitments her zeal in this matter was known abroad at montreal and halifax and gibraltar commanding officers who were trying to start or develop instructions of the kind applied to her she often succeeded in obtaining war office grants for them and these she supplemented by gifts of her own no inconsiderable portion of her resources at this time went in subscriptions of this sort either in money or in kind carpentering equipment bagatelle boards books prints and the like it is pleasant to read the letters in which the non-commissioned officers and men of regiments which had been served by miss nightingale in the crimea sent thanks through their commanding officers to quote, that noble lady for her continued interest in the welfare of the british soldiers end quote it was a cause of great pleasure to miss nightingale that in eighteen sixty four her old friend of the scutari days general storks who had encouraged her there in work of this kind was appointed to the command at malta i am very grateful to you he wrote november tenth for seeing me the other day and can only express the great gratification i experienced on that occasion i can never forget the time when i was associated with you in the great work which has produced such satisfactory results and for which the whole army will ever thank you when one reflects on the condition of a soldier ten years ago and what it is now there is cause for wonder at the difficulties you have overcome and the results you have achieved and on november eighteenth all the arrangements contemplated at malta both legislative if necessary and administrative shall be submitted for your consideration and approval in draft before they are acted upon and i need not say how grateful i shall be for your kind assistance in later years miss nightingale took a friendly interest in the soldiers institute at portsmouth founded by miss sarah robinson a meeting was held in its support at the mansion house in eighteen seventy seven at which lord wolseley presided and a letter from miss nightingale was read 
if you knew she said as i do or once did the difference between our soldiers cared for in body mind and morals and our soldiers uncared for the last hell's carnival the words are not my own the first the finest fellows of god's making if you knew how troops immediately on landing are beset with invitations to bad of all kinds you would hasten to supply them with invitations to and means for good of all kinds remembering that the soldier is of all men the man whose life is made for him by the necessities of his service we may not hope to make saints of all but we can make men of them instead of brutes if you knew these things as i do you would forgive me for asking you if my poor name may still be that of the soldier's ever faithful servant to support miss robinson's work in making men of them at portsmouth the place of all others of temptation to be brutes End quote. seven even the multifarious interests described in preceding pages and chapters do not tell the whole tale of miss nightingale's labors during this time it was not only the british soldiers at home and in india whom she took under her protection nor only the war office and the india office with which she had some connection she was open to any human appeal for help and her acquaintance with sir george grey led her through a friendly minister at the colonial office to make an attempt for the protection of the aboriginal races in the british dominions she had met sir george grey in eighteen fifty nine and eighteen sixty and he had talked to her about the gradual disappearance of those races when brought into touch with civilization this was a subject which appealed strongly to miss nightingale her mission in life was to be a saviour of men it shamed her to think that her country in colonizing so large a part of the world should so often come into contact with inferior races only to destroy them in the course of conversation with sir george grey the question was raised whether the disappearance of the aboriginal races was in any degree due to the effect of european school usages and school education miss nightingale determined to investigate the matter she drew up schedules of inquiry and the duke of newcastle then colonial secretary officially circulated them to colonial schools and colonial hospitals eighteen sixty as each return came in during following years it was forwarded from the colonial office to miss nightingale her inquiries were far more searching and detailed i notice upon looking through the papers than were the answers there were not many passionate statisticians in those days among the schoolmasters or doctors attached to native schools or hospitals in distant colonies and the results of miss nightingale's researches in this obscure field were somewhat disappointing she summarized the information in a paper which she contributed to the social science congress at edinburgh in eighteen sixty three and which she printed as a pamphlet the duke of newcastle sent the pamphlet to colonial governors and other officials and invited their remarks to the congress in eighteen sixty four miss nightingale contributed a further paper also printed as a pamphlet embodying the substance of some of the latter information thus obtained the documents which she received from the colonial office during several years are preserved amongst her papers and form what is i suppose a unique collection of information on a curious subject though her researches did not lead to any positive conclusions in relation to the effect of education as such upon the deterioration of the wild races they disclosed much neglect of sanitary precautions she pointed out mistakes that were made in the kind of clothing into which the name of decency the native children were put she applied in a wider way the principle that their open-air habits should be remembered insisting especially on the importance of physical and manual training the returns from colonial hospitals showed again that preventable causes bad drainage bad water and so forth were to blame for much of the mortality Quote, in civilization with its inherent diseases when brought into contact with civilization without adopting specific precautions for preserving health will always carry with it a large increase of mortality on account of the greater susceptibility of its subjects to those causes of disease which can to a certain extent be endured without as great a risk by civilized communities born among them End quote. 
but principally miss nightingale based upon the results of her inquiries a moral appeal to the conscience of popular opinion and governments in the colonies and in downing street Quote, the decaying races are chiefly in australia new zealand canada and perhaps in certain parts of south africa they appear to consist chiefly of tribes which have never been civilized enough or had force of character enough to form fixed settlements or to build towns such tribes have few fixed habits or none but the papers show that they are naturally in their uncivilized condition possessed of far stronger stamina and that they resist the effects of frightful wounds and injuries far better than civilized men this latter fact tells strongly against any natural proclivity to diseased action End quote. the course of history does not show that such appeals as miss nightingale's have been wholly successful it seems to be as mr froud said that with men as with orders of creation only those wild races will survive who can domesticate themselves into servants of the newer forms where there is such ability where the labor of the colored races is required by the white men the aboriginal races survive and even thrive and multiply where those conditions do not exist they do not survive so far however as the extinction of native races has been arrested miss nightingale was among the pioneers in pointing out the way her clear intelligence acting upon the mass of evidence which she had collected perceived certain principles which have guided all practical statesmen who sought to protect aborigines and to free civilization from one of its disgraces she urged that provision of land should be made for the exclusive use of existing tribes she pleaded passionately for the suppression of the liquor traffic she argued that in the formal education and in all other means of endeavoring to improve the natives there should be as little interference as possible with their born habits and conditions that interference should be wise and gradual and that above all physical training and a large amount of outdoor work are essentially necessary to success she did not succeed in arresting the decline of the aboriginal races but she contributed something to their protection eight thus then in all the various ways described in this chapter did miss nightingale labor but especially in the cause of the british army the role of the soldier's friend which she had filled in the crimea was enacted on a conspicuous stage her work was now all done behind the scenes and done as i have already described under heavy physical disability much of the work was moreover dull and even uncongenial but she fed her soul on higher things miss nightingale to mrs moore thirty two south street december fifteenth eighteen sixty three dearest reverend mother i am here as you see my brother-in-law's house where you were so good as to see me last year to think of that being more than a year ago and have been here a good bit but i have had all your dear letters and you cannot think how much they have encouraged me they are almost the only earthly encouragement i have i have been so very ill and even the little change of moving here knocks me down for a month but god is so good as to let me still struggle on with my business but with so much difficulty that it was quite impossible to me to write even to you and i only write now because i hear you are ill i have felt so horribly ungrateful for never having thanked you for your books st jean de la croix's life i keep thankfully and i am never tired of reading that part where he prays for the return of all his services domini pati et contemni prote i am afraid i never could ask that but in return for very little service i get it it is quite impossible to describe how harassing how heartbreaking my work has been since the beginning of july i have always with all my heart and soul offered myself to god for the greatest bitterness on my own part if his war office work could be done but lately nothing was done and always because there is not one man like sidney herbert to do it i don't think st jean de la croix need have prayed to be dismissed from superior ships before he died for as the mayor de brichard says there are more opportunities to humble oneself to mortify oneself to throw oneself entirely on god in them than in anything else i return the life of st catherine de genoa 
i like it so much it is a very singular and suggestive life i am so glad she accepted the being directress of the hospital for i think it was much better for her to make the hospital servants go right than to receive their injuries however submissively much better for the poor patients i mean i am quite ashamed to keep st therese so long but there is a good deal of reading in her and i am only able to read at night and then not always a large close printed book pray say if i shall send her back and i will borrow her again from you perhaps some day i am so sorry about poor s gonzaga's troubles i know what those committees are i have had to deal with them almost all my life my strength has failed more than usually of late and i don't think i have much more work in me not at least if it is to continue of this last harassing sort god called me to hospital work as i fondly thought for life but since then to army work but with a promise that i should go back to hospital as i thought as a nurse but as i now think as a patient but st catherine of siena says quote, et toutefois je permets cela lui advenir afin qu'il soit plus soigné de fuir soi-même et de venir à recourir à moi et qu'il considère que par amour je lui donne des moyens de tirer hors le chef de la vraie humilité se réputant indigne de la paix et repos de pensée comme mes autres serviteurs et au contraire se réputant digne des peines qu'il souffre my sister and her family come to spend here two or three nights occasionally to see friends but i was only able to see her for ten minutes and my good brother-in-law who is one of the best and kindest of men not at all nor his children i sent you back st francis de sales with many thanks i liked him in his old dress i like that story where the man loses his crown of martyrdom because he will not be reconciled with his enemy it is a sound lesson i am going to send you back st francis xavier his is a life i always like to study as well as those of all the early jesuit fathers but how much they did and how little i do ever my dearest reverend mothers loving and grateful f n miss nightingale never lost sight of the end in the means she was doing god's work in the war office she thought it was little that she did for it is often the hardest workers who thus deem themselves the most unprofitable servants and the work was often drudgery yet through it all she had inspiration from her memories of heroism in the army for whose salvation she was working i have seen to-day from my window she wrote to her mother in eighteen sixty three the first levy since all are dead whom i wished to please a melancholy sight to me yet i like the pomp and pageant of the old veterans covered with well-earned crosses to me who saw them earned no vain pageant it is like the dead march in saul to me who heard it on the battlefield no vain sound but full of deep and glorious sadness this ends part five chapter four advisory council to the war office part five chapter five of the life of florence nightingale volume two this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life of Florence Nightingale, Volume 2 by Edward Tyus Cook. Chapter 5 Helpers, Visitors, and Friends, 1862 to 1866. Parts 1, 2, 3, and 4 to be alone is nothing but to be without sympathy in a crowd this is to be confined in solitude where there is want of sympathy of attraction given and returned must it not be a feeling of starvation florence nightingale suggestions for thought eighteen sixty friendship should help the friends to work out better the work of life benjamin jowett eighteen sixty six the years of miss nightingale's life described in this part were perhaps those of her hardest and most unremitting work 
throughout these years until august eighteen sixty six she lived entirely in london or immediately near to it her quarters were in lodgings or in hired houses until november eighteen sixty five when her father took a house for her for a term of years in south street number thirty five near her married sister this house number ten when the street was renumbered was the one that she occupied till her death i think that there was not a single day during the period from eighteen sixty two to eighteen sixty six upon which she was not engaged in one part or another of the manifold work described in preceding chapters and there was much other work as well begun in these years but brought to completion later which will be described in a subsequent part she gave account of her days to madame mohl january twenty fourth eighteen sixty five and recalled what a poor woman with thirteen children who took in washing once said to me her idea of heaven was to have one hour a day in which she could do nothing yet all that miss nightingale did was done forcefully i am completely reassured as to the state of your health wrote her old friend mr reeve january twenty one eighteen sixty five in reply to some communication on indian affairs by the homeric frame of mind you are in you will live an hundred years you will write a sanitariad or a laurentiad in twenty-four books and lord darby will translate you into all known languages stanley will be lord darby then but this will only make the thing more appropriate but her work though very vigorous was very hard it was done not as in the crimean war in the excitement of immediate action nor as in the years succeeding her return with the daily aid and sympathy of her dear master it was her hardest work for another reason already mentioned she was for a large part of this later period almost bedridden she would get up and dress in order to receive the more important of her men visitors but the effort tired her greatly the amount of work which she did under these conditions is extraordinary and the question arises how she did it a principal explanation is to be found in dr sutherland the reader may have noticed once or twice in letters written by miss nightingale such expressions as we are doing so and so or can such and such be sent to us the plural was not royal it signified she had explained at an earlier time to sidney herbert the troops and me but it also signified during the years with which this part is concerned herself and dr sutherland she wrote incessantly but even so she could hardly have accomplished her daily tasks without some clerical assistance she knew an immense deal about the subjects with which she dealt and her memory was both precise and tenacious but there were limits to her powers of acquisition and cases often arose in which personal inspection or personal moving about in search of information were essential in all these ways dr sutherland's help was constant he wielded a ready pen he was one of the leading sanitary experts of the day his professional and official connections gave him access to various sources of information his regular work was on the army sanitary commission and for the rest he placed himself at miss nightingale's beck and call mrs sutherland was her private secretary at this time for household affairs such as searching for lodgings and engaging servants her accounts were still kept and much of her miscellaneous correspondence conducted by her uncle mr sam smith but in all official business her factotum was dr sutherland a large proportion of the notes drafts and memoranda belonging to these years among her papers is in dr sutherland's handwriting and sometimes it is impossible to determine how much of the work is hers and how much his often he took down heads from her conversation and put the matter into shape at other times he submitted drafts for her approval or correction and took copies of the letters ultimately dispatched 
how indispensable to her was dr sutherland's help comes out from some correspondence of eighteen sixty five captain galton had sent private word that there was talk at the war office of appointing dr sutherland commissioner to inquire into an outbreak of cholera at some of the mediterranean stations miss nightingale was greatly perturbed we are full of indian business she wrote november one which must be settled before parliament meets lord stanley has consented to take it up and i have pledged myself to have it all ready a thing i should never have done if i had thought dr sutherland would be sent abroad you are yourself aware that calcutta water supply has been sent home to us at my request and dr s told me this morning that he and i should have to write the report and again december fifteenth for god's sake if you can prevent dr sutherland going she had begged that at any rate nothing should be said to dr sutherland himself about it unless the mission were irrevocably decided upon he is so childish that if he heard of this malta and gibraltar business he would instantly declare there was nothing to keep him in england the child the baby of some earlier correspondence only liked a little change sometimes indispensable though he was to his task mistress he yet as in former days vexed her she thought him lacking in method and with her this was one of the unpardonable sins he sometimes forgot what he had done with or had promised to do with a particular paper he was even capable of mislaying a blue book he was often behindhand with tasks imposed upon him his temperament was a little volatile and in one impeachment he is accused of incurable looseness of thought if this were so which i take leave to doubt the defect must have been congenital or long service under miss nightingale would have cured it partly because dr sutherland's manner sometimes teased her partly because he was deaf and partly owing to her own physical disabilities miss nightingale developed at this time a method of communicating with him which during later years became familiar to all but her most privileged friends the visitor on being admitted was ushered into a sitting-room on the ground floor and given pencil and paper it were well for him that what he wrote should be lucid and concise the message was carried upstairs into the presence and an answer similarly written was brought down and to such interchange would the interview be confined with dr sutherland miss nightingale had many personal interviews their business was often too detailed too intricate too confidential to be conducted otherwise but there are hundreds of letters received from other people upon which in blank spaces or on spare sheets there are pencilled notes conveying answers or messages to dr sutherland well you know i have already said that to lord stanley i can't do more yes you must oh lord bless you no you want me to decide in order that you may do the reverse can you answer a plain question you have forgotten all we talked about i cannot flatter you on your lucidity i do not shake hands till the abstract is done and i do not leave london till it is done you told me positively there was nothing to be done there is everything to be done why did you tell me that tremendous banger was it to prevent my worrying you nothing has been done i have been so anxious but the more zeal i feel the more indifferent you sometimes he strikes work or refuses to answer signing his name by a drawing of a dry pump with a handle marked f n your pump is dry india to stand over sometimes he makes fun of her business-like methods and heads his notes ref zero 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 zero, zero over zero 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 sometimes he pleads illness i'm very sorry but i was too ill to know anything except that i was ill often he received visitors for her or entertained them on her behalf at luncheon or dinner these two people have come will you see them for me i have explained who you are 
was the luncheon good did he eat did he walk yes then he's a liar he told me he couldn't move in eighteen sixty five to sixty six dr and mrs sutherland had moved house from finchley to norwood miss nightingale complained of this remoteness dr sutherland dated his letters from the gulf he stayed there sometimes complaining of indisposition instead of coming up to south street where business was pressing miss nightingale did not take the reason kindly and his letters begin respected enemy or dear howling epileptic friend one morning june twenty three eighteen sixty five dr sutherland went to the private view of the herbert hospital a great occasion to miss nightingale in the afternoon he called and sent up to her a short note of what he had seen and that is all you condescend to tell me and i get it at four o'clock of course they understood each other they were old and intimate friends but i think that the man who thus served with miss nightingale must have had a great and disinterested zeal for the causes in which they were engaged and that there must have been something at once formidable and fascinating in the lady-in-chief two the pressure of work during these years caused miss nightingale to close her doors resolutely she did indeed see her father often her mother and sister occasionally though she did not press them to come other relations and many of her friends felt aggrieved that she would not accept help which they would have liked to give but she had a rule of life to which she adhered firmly there was so much strength available likely enough as she still supposed to be ended by early death there was so much public work to be done there was no strength to spare for family or friends except in so far as they helped and did not hinder the public work she saw nurses and matrons from time to time they were parts of her life work she saw lady herbert and mrs bracebridge they were parts of her work in the past she never omitted to write to lady herbert on the anniversary of lord herbert's death though their friendship lost something of its former intimacy when in eighteen sixty five lady herbert joined the church of rome other friends were seldom admitted letters to an old friend who was sometimes received and sometimes turned away explain miss nightingale's point of view to madame mole one fifteen park street july thirty eighteen sixty four you will be doing me a favour if you come to me august two is a terrible anniversary to me and i shall not have my usual solace for mrs bracebridge has always come to spend that day with me and i am sure she would have come this year but i could not tell whether i should be able to get sir john lawrence's things off by that time it does me good to be with you as with mrs clive because it reduces individual struggles to general formulae it does me harm intensely alone as i am to be with people who do the reverse but it is incorrect to say as mrs clive does that i will not let people help me or as others do that no one can help me anybody could have helped me who knew how to read and write and what o'clock it is june twenty three eighteen sixty five south street clarky mole darling how i should like to see you now but it is quite 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 impossible i am sure no one ever gave up so much to live who longs so much to die as i do and give up daily it is the only credit i claim i will live if i can i shall be so glad if i can't i am overwhelmed with business and i have an indian functionary now in london whose work is cut out for him every day at my house i scarcely even have half an hour's ease would you tell m mole this if you are writing about the queen of holland's proposed visit to me i really feel it a great honour that she wishes to see me she is a queen of queens but it is quite 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 impossible october fourth eighteen sixty five i am so weak no one knows how weak i am yesterday because i saw dr sutherland for a few minutes in the afternoon after the morning's work and my good mrs sutherland for a few minutes after him i was with a spasm of the heart till seven o'clock this morning and nearly unfit for work all to-day 
in the case of one distinguished visitor to london miss nightingale made an exception this was garibaldi she was a sworn garibaldian as we have heard he wished to see her she was famous in italy and she had subscribed to his funds friends told her that she might be able to influence the hero in the direction of her own interests and with some trepidation she prepared herself to receive him i think wrote mr jowett that we may trust god to give us his own calmness and clearness on any great occasion such as this is i hope you will inspire garibaldi for the future and not pain him too much about the past ten years more of such a life as his might accomplish almost anything for italy in the way of military organization and sanitary and moral improvement if he could only see that his duty is not to break the yet immature strength of italy against austrian fortresses miss nightingale prepared for the great occasion by jotting down in french what she would try to say eh bien in five years you have made italy the work of five centuries you have worked a miracle but even you mon general could not make a steam-engine in five minutes and italy has to be consolidated into a strong machine like those which you have been seeing at bedford and so forth and so forth she tried to keep the fact of the interview secret but it was chronicled in the newspapers miss nightingale to harriet martineau one fifteen park street april twenty eighth eighteen sixty four you may have heard that i have seen garibaldi i resisted it with all my might but i was obliged to do it i asked no one to look at him told no one and he came in my brother-in-law's carriage hoping that no one would know but it all failed we had a long interview by ourselves i was more struck with the greatness of that noble heart full of bitterness yet not bitter and with the smallness of the administrative capacity than even i expected he raves for a government like the english but he knows no more what it is than his king bomba did it was for this that i was to speak to him one year of such a life as i have led for ten years would tell him more of how one has to give and take with a representative government than all his utopia and his ideal you will smile but he reminds me of plato he talks about the ideal good and the ideal bad about his not caring for republica or for monarchia he only wants the right alas alas what a pity that utter impracticability i pity me very much and of all my years this last has been the hardest but now i see that no man would have put up with what i have put up with for ten years to do even the little i have done which is about a hundredth part of what i have tried for garibaldi looks flushed and very ill worn and depressed not excited he looks as if he stood and went through all this as he stood under the bullets of aspromonte a duty which he was here to perform the madness of the italians here in urging him is inconceivable miss nightingale we may safely infer did not inspire garibaldi with divine fervour for sanitary reform or any merely administrative progress administration in any sort was foreign to his genius but she felt after the interview no less than before that it was a great occasion to her the interview took place at one fifteen park street a house belonging to the grosvenor hotel and she presented the hotel with a bust of garibaldi as a memento of the occasion another of her heroes was abraham lincoln of whom she wrote this appreciation thirty four south street june twenty eighteen sixty five dear sir i have not dared to press in with my feeble word of sympathy upon your overtaxed time and energy when all europe was pouring in upon you with its heartfelt sympathy my experience has been infinitesimally small still small as it is it has been of historical events and i can never remember the time not even when the colossal calamity of the crimea was first made known to us not even when we lost our own albert and our albert was no common hero remember that it was no sovereign but it was washington whom he held up as an example to himself and his 
i can never remember the time when so deep and strong a cry of feeling has gone up from the world in all its length and breadth and in all its classes as has gone up for you and yours in your great trial mr lincoln's death as some one said of him he will hold the purest and the greatest place in history i trust and believe that the deed which will spring up from that noble grave will be worthy of it i will not take up your time with weak expression of a deep sympathy sincerely yours florence nightingale at home the political event which most moved her was the death of lord palmerston miss nightingale to dr farr thirty four south street october nineteen eighteen sixty five l d palmerston is a great loss i speak for the country and myself he was a powerful protector to me especially since sidney herbert's death i never asked him to do anything you may be sure i did not ask him often but he did it for the last nine years he did not do himself justice if the right thing was to be done he made a joke but he did it he will not leave his impress on the age but he did the country good service except el napoleon whose death might be the greatest good or the greatest evil i doubt whether there is any man's loss which will so affect europe he was at heart the most liberal man we had left i have lost in him a powerful friend i hear spoken of as his successors clarendon russell granville l d clarendon it is said the queen wishes and she has been corresponding with him privately perhaps by l d palmerston's own desire but i believe the real question is under which if any of these your mr gladstone will consent to remain in office and be leader of the h o of c not one of these men will manage the cabinet as l d palmerston did but i dare say you have more trustworthy information than i have i would l d palmerston had lived another session we should have got something done at the poor law board which we shall not now l d russell is so queer-tempered i quite dread his premiership if it comes three miss nightingale's interest in the working classes led her in eighteen sixty five to draft a scheme which in some aspects of it forestalled ideas of a later generation of social reformers mr gladstone had recently passed an act enabling a depositor's accumulations in the post office savings bank to be invested in the purchase either of an annuity or an insurance it would be very advisable she suggested to add to these methods of saving facilities for the purchase of small freeholds there was nothing that the working men more coveted than the ownership of a house or a piece of land an extension of small ownership would satisfy a legitimate craving increase the motives to thrift and raise the social position and independence of the working classes if the adoption of the scheme would necessitate the enfranchisement of leaseholds so much the better such were miss nightingale's ideas and under different forms and by different methods they have occupied the attention of social reformers to this day she submitted her scheme to mr villiers president of the poor law board who seems to have been somewhat favourable to it then she tackled the chancellor of the exchequer artfully suggesting that her scheme was merely on the one hand a slight development of his most successful savings bank measures and on the other an indirect means of meeting his earnest desire to extend the suffrage but mr gladstone was not to be cajoled it would not do he told her for government to become land jobbers an opinion which has not been shared it would seem by some of mr gladstone's successors he had further suggested that the scheme should be submitted in its legal aspects to his friend mr roundell palmer and mr palmer after reading it opined that the law already gave adequate facilities for the purchase of freeholds by working men and others 
miss nightingale then took other legal opinions with a view to meeting objections but she presently gave up this addition to her schemes it was certainly she said the wildest of ideas for me to undertake it just now when i can scarcely do what i have already undertaken four though miss nightingale saw little of her friends or relations at this time she constantly corresponded with them there are many letters which tell of her grief at the death of her cousin miss hilary bonham carter the golden bowl is broken she wrote to madame mole september eighth eighteen sixty five and it was the very purest gold i have ever known there are letters from many correspondents lady augusta bruce for instance and mrs william cowper which show how deeply they had been touched by miss nightingale's letters of condolence her own griefs left room for sympathy with those of others to dr farr hampstead august five eighteen sixty four i am sorry to hear of your griefs i do not find that mine close my heart to those of others and i should be more than anxious to hear of yours you who have been our faithful friend for so many years i have heard of your father's death but not of any other loss sidney herbert has been dead three years on the second and these three years have been nothing but a slow undermining of all he has done at the w o this is the bitterest grief the mere personal craving after a beloved presence i feel as nothing a few years at most and that will be over but the other is never over for me i look forward to pursuing god's work soon in another of his worlds i do not look forward with any craving to seeing again those i have lost in the very next world sure that that will all come in his own good time and sure of my willingness to work in whichever of his worlds i am most wanted with or without those dear fellow-workers as he pleases but this does not at all soothe the pain of seeing men wantonly deface the work here of some of his best workers but i shall bear your faith in mind that good works never really die alas good tulloch but i think his work was done pray if you speak of him remember had it not been for him where would our two army sanitary inquiries have been miss nightingale's large circle of correspondence kept her in touch with the literary as well as with the political world she suffered greatly from sleeplessness and read much at night she seldom read a book without finding something original or characteristic to say about it lately she wrote to m mole january twenty fourth eighteen sixty five i have read an english translation of the rubaiyat of omar khayyam the way it interests me is theologically otherwise he seems a poor weak mixture of mahomet and a mephistopheles but the arguments which he despises seem to me just the real arguments the only arguments if only we believe in a perfect god for eternal existence do tell me a little about this and about the sufis and ferdowsi as regards their belief in a god and whether the god was good or bad if any omar was new to m mole miss nightingale lent him fitzgerald's version and m mole read the original the tidings she wrote that you may perhaps print al khayyam's quatrains is diffusing joy among a not large but select circle i having communicated it in the proper quarter see how we are all tarred with the same official stick if you send me a copy i shall immediately become a personage of importance i read some of madame roland's memoirs she wrote to madame mot may twenty eighteen sixty five but do you know i was so disappointed to find out that her patriotism was inspired by a lover not that i care much about virtue i do think virtue by itself a very second-rate virtue but because i did hope that here was one woman who cared for res publica as alone or as chief among her cares do to madame mole september eighth eighteen sixty five read if you have not read swinburne's atalanta in caledon forgive it its being an imitation of a greek play that is its worst fault as you said of macaulay's lays they are like an old man in a pinafore 
or as i should say of this it is like a puritan togged out as a priest going to say mass but read it the atalanta herself though she is only a sort of gin and not a woman at all has more reality more character more individuality to use a bad word than all the jeunes premieres and all the men novelists i ever have read walter scott lytton bower and all of them but then atalanta is not a sound incarnation of any social or economic principle is she so men will say end of helpers visitors and friends one two three four